There is increasing debate in the news, social media, books, and other publications about requiring former slaveholding countries to pay reparations to the descendants of enslaved people. The debate is always controversial, oftentimes illuminating, sometimes biased by tribalism, occasionally loud, many times based on fear and avoidance, and too many times filled with misinformation, intentional, or born out of apathy or willful ignorance. The first part of this series is an attempt to present the historical context and arguments that fuel the debate for reparations and filter out the misinformation. The second part focuses on the demands of advocates and the obstacles they face. Slavery, regardless of where it was practiced in the Americas, is well documented in history. There are inventory records by owners of the enslaved and by ship captains. There are oral and written accounts by former enslaved people, archived government documents in institutions, implements of torture and bondage in museums, and photographic footage that is readily available to all. As a result, I will not spend any time here detailing the incomprehensible horrors of slavery. I will refer you instead to view my YouTube documentary on the history of slavery, colonialism, rebellion, and servitude in Grenada. Also, no time will be spent trying to counter the abhorrent rantings of racists, white supremacists, and those who seek notoriety or financial gain by pandering to the former. Following them down the rabbit hole of hatred and obfuscation would only lead to the sewer which they inhabit. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines reparations as the act of making amends, offering expiation, or giving satisfaction for a wrong or injury, something done or given as amends or satisfaction. For those who use the Bible as the ultimate reference point for all decisions, there's a reference there too. Deuteronomy 15 verses 12 through 15 states, If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, then in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, and from your winepress from what the Lord your God has blessed you with, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing today. There are a few who equate slavery with genocide. However, technically speaking, slavery cannot be considered the equivalent of genocide since genocide is the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the intent of destroying that nation or group. Owners of enslaved people needed the labor of the enslaved, so deliberately exterminating them as a race or ethnic group would be counterproductive. As the Bible implies, reparations is not a new concept. Countries, exploited groups, and even exploiters have been compensated in the past for a variety of heinous injustices. Some examples include, in the United Kingdom, there was the Slave Compensation Act of 1837. It was enacted as an act of parliament authorizing approximately 20 million pounds in compensation to owners of enslaved people in the British colonies for the loss of their enslaved people who are now free because of the abolition of slavery. Based on a government census of 1834, over 40,000 awards to owners of enslaved people were issued. 
because the compensation was in the form of government annuities, the payments lasted until 2015. Ironically, the enslaved people themselves were not compensated in any way. My family in England owned slaves here on Grenada, and though we never set foot on the island, we profited from the sale of sugar. And when slavery was finally abolished, we got compensation from the British government. The slaves got nothing. Now Grenada is debating the idea of reparations for slavery and what that means. I've come here to confront the past and to ask how it shapes the future. In 1952, Germany signed reparation agreements with Israel and an advocacy group representing other countries, Jewish and non-Jewish, for the crimes of the Holocaust committed during World War II. Approximately over $92 billion has been paid to date to Israel, including direct payments to the victims. Israel used the money for, among other things, to establish a merchant fleet and fund its electrical and railway systems. It's reported that the country's GNP tripled in the 12 years after the agreement. In America, in 1862, before slavery was officially abolished, the federal government passed the District of Columbia Compensated Emancipation Act, which allowed former slave owners in the district to be compensated for the loss of their enslaved people. One million dollars was set aside for the compensation. The objective was to help bring about an end to slavery. An additional $100,000 was allocated to help newly enslaved people emigrate to Liberia or Haiti. Each would be given $100 if they so decided. President Lincoln signed the act and it has since been celebrated as Emancipation Day in the District of Columbia. Not surprisingly, the act did not include any compensation for the newly freed enslaved people. Also in America, the U.S. Civil Liberties Act of 1988 granted reparations to Japanese Americans who had been interned by the United States government during World War II simply because they were Japanese and some felt could not be trusted while the United States was engaged in a war with Japan. The act was signed into law by President Ronald Reagan. It granted each surviving attorney $20,000 in compensation, with payments beginning in 1990. The legislation stated that government actions had been based on race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership, as opposed to legitimate security concerns. A total of 82,219 people received compensation checks. In Brazil, the 1988 Constitution established that communities descending from runaway enslaved peoples, known in Brazil as quilombos, would receive official recognition and a collective title to their lands. In 2003, the government recognized the claims of all Afro-descendant communities to receive a collective land deed, effectively creating a program of reparations for slavery for all Afro-Brazilians living in predominantly black villages and even urban neighborhoods. By 2017, the government had recognized more than 2,000 communities and issued titles to about 10% of them. It had also started implementing a comprehensive agenda for quilombo communities that included education, housing, food security, and other policies. After legal challenges by opponents of the constitutional arrangements granting rights to the quilombo, in 2018, the Brazilian Supreme Court upheld its constitutionality. Profiting from slavery by means of owning, insuring, 
financing or utilizing enslaved labor was not just the sole domain of wealthy individuals. It included American founding fathers, presidents, and members of royal families. In addition, it also included institutions of higher learning and corporations. It appears that almost everyone of means saw an opportunity to cash in on a very lucrative enterprise, and they did so. Some of the prominent corporations and institutions include Harvard University, the Bank of England, Yale University, Lehman Brothers, Aetna, J.P. Morgan Chase, Princeton University, Barclays, Lloyds of London, Columbia University, and Georgetown University. Some institutions have lately developed plans to, in effect, address the issue of reparations. Harvard University, for example, plans to set up a legacy of slavery fund to strategically invest in identifying black and indigenous students who are direct descendants of people formerly enslaved in the United States. The fund will help promote educational support and programming. The plan also calls for partnering with historically black colleges and universities among other things. Lloyds of London plans to invest in programs to attract, retain, and develop black and minority ethnic talent and provide financial support to charities and organizations. It is important to note that the enslavement of millions of African people by the nations of Europe and America is distinct from other major atrocities in terms of both scope and scale. It lasted hundreds of years, impacted multiple countries, uprooted, displaced, and brutally enslaved millions of people, while at the same time enriching nations, companies, and individuals, some still benefiting from the past exploitation of their fellow man. Slavery, in effect, was the fuel that powered the economies of Europe and America. During slavery, the Southern Confederate States of America would have ranked as the fourth richest country in the world, due almost entirely to the value and labor of its enslaved people. The Confederate States produced 75% of the world's cotton. In 1835, cotton accounted for 55% of U.S. exports. Slavery produced new markets for Britain. Between 17 and 1800, British trade went through a major transformation. It went from doing 80% of its business with Europe to 60% with America and Africa. Slavery was sanctioned and codified in laws. It was forced and cruel labor. It was murderous, dehumanizing, and sought to erase the culture, language, and beliefs of its subjects. Beyond forced labor, there was also the concerted effort to deny the advancement of black people at any cost. Educating enslaved people was illegal. Even congregating for prayers was either limited or discouraged for fear it may lead to the enlightenment of the spirit and mind. Slavery was finally abolished in the colonies of the United Kingdom in 1833, in France in 1848, in the U.S. in 1865, and in the Portuguese colonies, including Brazil, in 1888. This means that blacks in the Americas have endured slavery for longer than they have been freed. Slavery may have broken the backs of enslaved people, but not always the will to survive and thrive. Despite continued roadblocks and obstacles, many descendants of slavery have been able to attain some measure of success and accomplishments. For the great majority, however, the statistics are alarming when compared to white populations. For example, Whites in America have approximately 13 times the median household income of blacks. The descendants of enslaved people in the Americas 
suffered disproportionately from higher rates of infant mortality, violence, broken families, and poor healthcare services and outcomes. Sociologists and healthcare experts often associate these disadvantages with the corrosive legacy of slavery and its continued discrimination and demoralization. For the proponents of reparations, the legacy of slavery goes beyond the end of emancipation and must include compensation for the continued and deliberate subjugation, oppression, brutalization, and exploitation of the former enslaved people and their descendants. They draw a bold, direct line between the disparities of blacks and whites that is evidenced today, financially, socially, medically, and legally. In far too many ways, American Negroes have been another nation. Deprived of freedom, crippled by hatred, the doors of opportunity closed to hope. In our time, change has come to this nation too. The American Negro, acting with impressive restraint, has peacefully protested and marched, entered the courtroom and the seats of government demanding a justice that has long been denied. The voice of the Negro was the call to action. But freedom is not enough. You do not wipe away the scars of centuries by saying now, you are free to go where you want and do as you desire and choose the leaders you please. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberating, bringing up to the starting line of a race and then say, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. Thus, it is not enough just to open the gates of opportunity. All our citizens must have the ability to walk through those gates. And this is the next and the more profound stage of the battle for civil rights. We seek not just freedom, but opportunity. We seek not just legal equity, but human ability not just equality as a right and a theory, but equality as a fact and equality as a result. To this end, equal opportunity is essential, but not enough, not enough. Men and women of all races are born with the same range of abilities. But ability is not just the product of birth. Ability is stretched or studied by the family that you live with and the neighborhood you live in, by the school you go to and the poverty or the richness of your surroundings. It is the product of a hundred unseen forces playing upon the little infant the child, and finally, the man. Let's look now at examples in three different countries on how oppression and exploitation continued after slavery and why reparation advocates see a direct link to the conditions that exist today. In Haiti under the French, in 1825, 21 years after successfully defeating the French, and obtaining its independence, the French sent a naval fleet to the island of Haiti and demanded payment of 150 million francs in return for recognizing the island's independence. 
refusal of the ransom would have meant engaging in another long and bitter battle with no expectation of outside help from other countries who now saw the rise of a new black independent state as a bad example that could spread to other geographies. The Haitian government reluctantly agreed to the payments, although they knew they could not afford to make the payments. A loan was arranged with French bankers, including the Rothschilds. The resulting commissions raised the total amount of the loan to 156 million francs, plus interest. A government commission was also set up in France to award compensation to those who claimed losses due to the end of slavery on the island. The biggest payout, 350,000 francs, or 1.7 million in today's economy, went to two of the children of the biggest holder of enslaved people on the island. The first ransom payment to France was sent in sealed bags inside nailed crates on a French ship. This act of threatening or conducting violence from the sea and spiriting away the bounty by ship I can only describe as piracy. But one can also use the terms extortion or most simply robbery. The ransom payments continued for more than 100 years and left the island nation without revenues to invest in critical infrastructure, schools, and hospitals. The next example is in the Caribbean. Although slavery was abolished in the United Kingdom in 1833, the newly freed enslaved people were compelled to work for their former enslavers as apprentices for minimal or no wages for an additional four to six years, while at the same time the enslavers were being compensated for the loss of those very enslaved people. This, of course, was a blatant case of double dipping by the enslavers that was legally sanctioned by the British government. The last example is in America. Even after the official end of slavery in the United States, former enslaved people and their descendants continued to endure brutalization, segregation, and exploitation, financially, legally, socially, and otherwise during the Jim Crow era from 1870 to 1959. Black churches were attacked and bombed. Schools and housing were segregated. Neighborhoods were firebombed and destroyed by white mobs. Healthcare was discriminatory. Banks refused loans to blacks or utilized discriminatory measures to segregate neighborhoods. Even today, Blacks are targeted and murdered in their places of worship and elsewhere. The Jim Crow period also saw the second rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Lynchings were almost commonplace, and laws were implemented to penalize, incarcerate, and downright dispossess Blacks. Many of the laws, including segregation and the blocking of opportunities to obtain loans and apply for government programs, prevented the vast majority of blacks from building wealth through home ownership, starting new businesses, or obtaining higher education. As an example, the U.S. government created the Federal Housing Administration, FHA, in 1934 to ensure private mortgages. This would eventually lead to making home ownership more affordable for millions of Americans. However, the FHA also adopted a system of redlining whereby black neighborhoods that were already forcibly segregated by law, violence, or historic patterns of migration were deemed ineligible for FHA financing and color-coded red on maps, thus the term redlining. The practice was not officially outlawed until 1968. Home ownership is the greatest source of wealth for most families. It is an asset. It is equity that can be used for other investments, and it can be passed on to one's family members as inheritance. 
The advantage of home ownership undoubtedly accounts for the greatest current source of wealth disparity between blacks and whites in America. These discriminatory laws and practices later facilitated predatory lending by financial institutions and other ruthless players that continued into the 1970s and morphed into other forms of predation that became so invasive in the financial system that eventually resulted in the 2008 financial crisis that impacted the entire nation. As an example, in 2001, Wells Fargo Bank created a unit to push expensive refinancing loans on black customers. According to a signed affidavit, they referred to subprime loans made in minority communities as ghetto loans and the minority customers as mud people. Despite the repressive and regressive practices that have harmed the nation as a whole, the lessons are still not fully comprehended by all. Even today, many states have enacted laws to surreptitiously and sometimes blatantly disenfranchise blacks and discourage teaching the truth about slavery. In 2022, the state of Florida passed laws prohibiting any discussion in public settings that would make people feel guilty or uncomfortable about their race. It also banned school books that sought to discuss or introduce critical race theory in grades K through 12 in public schools. Critical race theory holds that racism is more than simply individual biases or hatreds. It is embedded in our laws, institutions, and corporations, and reflected in the economic, political, educational, and social inequalities that minorities, especially blacks, encounter on an almost daily basis.